earnestly speak to the Lord and ask him to open your eyes, open your ears, open your heart that you may have understanding and be who you ought to be. That ignorance and error might be slain and that you might be set free at a time like this. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Faithful and everlasting Father, we give you glory again and again for bringing us to the top of this mountain to illumine us, to open our understanding, to teach us those things that are necessary for the hour. Lord, I ask that you release upon every one of us the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Lord, that we may understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Those things that have been hidden from the eyes of men. Lord, those things that are born behind the smoke screen and we have been walking and going not knowing where we are heading to remove the veil tonight and cause us to understand that we may take decisions that will never be regretted hereafter thank you for answer to our prayers have your way, Lord, in our hearts. Turn us by reason of the knowledge of thy word into young men and women of the princes of the provinces. Thank you because that is what you have done. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' victorious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated and open your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 24. What we have before us this evening is a message titled, Understanding the Events of the Last Days. Understanding the Events of the Last Days. Matthew 24, I want to read from verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming 
and the signs of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. From these scriptures, we are going to look into the events and the situations that are before us in this our generation and look into the scriptures to know whether they are those things that are so stated to characterize the last days before his second coming undoubtedly many of the present day events and happenings are to say the least very bizarre and completely off from the normal. Almost every day, new and more bizarre events take place and many people shudder. The rate of frequency at which we witness these novel, bizarre and strange events and situations is very much alarming. To understand what is really going on around us, we must trace the matter to their roots. We must go back to scripture, we must go back to prophecies and predictions of old, which God, God's Spirit made concerning the days that we live in now. From the place we read in Matthew 24, we see that Jesus predicted seven events that will precede his second coming and the end of the world. Because those were the two things the disciples asked him. What are the signs of your coming? Meanwhile, he was already with them, so they were talking about his coming again. And what are the signs of the end of the world? And those were the things that he began to make them understand. Seven things he predict predicted, seven events. One, he told them of the rising of false Christs. Many people that will come and claim to be Christ. That was in... Verse 5 of that Matthew 24 where we read. And if you go to verse 23 and 27, he now concluded the matter of false Christ by saying, when they will now begin to tell you, look, Jesus has come, he is in the desert. Don't go with them. He has come, he is in the secret chamber. Don't mind them. He said his coming will not be something that somebody will be told about. He said it will be like lightning that will strike in the east and will be seen in the west. 
He said, as for those that belong to him, they don't need to bother because wherever the carcass is, that is where the eagles will be attracted. That's where they will gather. Meaning that there will be something about him and about his people that whether they be on the other side of the earth or whether they be here, whether they be in the west or in the east, by the time he appears, they will be gathered unto him. He said nobody should worry about that. So, false Christ have all the times born with us from of old. He talked about wars and rumors of wars. In verse 6, those ones are common places. Those ones, the frequency of them in our generation is so terrible, is so alarming. He talked about famines and pestilences. Those ones are here with us as well. He talked about worldwide persecution of the people of God. That is also history. It has been there. It is also there with us. He talked about false prophets arising in verse 6. He talked about abounding iniquity and the last worldwide revival in verse 14. Seven events. Now to understand properly this teaching, we shall divide the teaching into one, the last days, meaning and implication. Two, prophecies and predictions concerning the last days. Three, understanding the events of our last days as fulfillment of the last days predictions and prophecies. And finally, the reaction of the worry. The person that is careful concerning his soul, what will be his or her reaction? What will be his or her decision having known these things? Point number one. What's the meaning of the last days? Looking at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. Going from that verse 1, on and on, to verse 31, the story of the creation was clearly stated. In chapter 2 and verse 1 of the same Genesis, we also see how that the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And in verse 2, on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So, God created the world, the entire universe. He created the earth. He made it habitable. He created human beings as the highest species on earth. And in chapter 1, verse 26, we see that he put man in charge of all that he made. Verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So from these scriptures we have read, we see that God gave man to be the head of all that he had created, to have dominion, to rule over it system or realm 
of man having dominion on earth would now end. So, we know that the devil is called the prince of this world. That is the ruler. Just because man handed over to him the dominion that God had given him at Eden. It was through deception. It was through deceit. It was through subtlety that the devil uh, beguiled man, deceived man, and man obeyed him instead of God. And the Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 that there is a law, a spiritual law that states that if you obey somebody, you become his servant. And that is why obedience to God makes somebody continually his servant. And at that point when there was a decision to be taken between obeying God and obeying the serpent, the devil, man through Adam and Eve, chose rather to obey the devil instead of uh, God. We recognize that when the devil came into the garden, he posed a question to Eve. As the Lord said, you shouldn't eat any of the fruits of this garden. She said, no. He didn't tell us that. He said, we should eat everything except only one tree, that we shouldn't eat the fruit of it. He said, the day we eat it, we will die. The devil said, you will not surely die. For he knows that the day you eat it, you will uh, be like him. You will be wise, knowing good and evil. Just look at it. It's a fruit that is good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And the summary of it was that man, Adam and Eve, decided to obey the devil and disobey God. And at the instant they did that, they became servants to the devil. They became slaves to Satan. And the law of Romans chapter 6 verse 16 came into play. And that law says, you are the servant of him who you obey. Praise the Lord. It was at that point that man came under the dominion of Satan. It was at that point that the devil became the ruler of this world. And that was the reason in Luke chapter 4 and verse 5 to 7, when he came tempting Jesus, he took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and showed him all the glories and the beauty of it and told Jesus, all these things you have seen, they are mine. They have been delivered into my hand. And whosoever I will, I will give it. If you will just fall down and worship me, everything will be handed over to you. Jesus Christ did not refute the claim of Satan that he was in charge, that it was delivered to him. Because Jesus knew what transpired at the Garden of Eden. When man obeyed him and became his servant, and of course, anything that a slave owns belongs to his master. Am I right? So, that was how the dominion that Adam and Eve had over everything in the world became that of Satan. It was delivered into his hand. So he became the prince of this world. So, it means that anything toward the end of 6,000 years of man's stay on earth is talking about the last days. That was the reason. At about 30 AD, when John the Baptist started his ministry, 30 years into the last 2,000 years, he began to declare and to say, make haste, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is now at hand. That thing has lasted for 4,000 years. It remains only 2,000 years. So it is at hand as at that time. Jesus began six months after. And the same thing he was saying 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as he was talking, he was talking about the last days. He was talking about the end of the world. He was talking about the time he will come again to take over everything again. And the disciples had heard him say it over and over. And in that particular occasion, as they showed him the temple, the beauty, the glory, and the precious stones that we are used to decorate it, he said, don't worry about these things. A time is shortly coming when there shall not be one stone upon another in this beautiful temple. And uh, they connected it with the end of the world that he has been telling them about. So they now came to him privately and said, now tell us plainly, when shall these things be? The things you have said severally, you have said numerously, when shall they be? And what shall be the signs of your coming back to this world? And the times of the end of the world. That was what occasioned the series of teaching concerning the last days. So, the last days talk about the time toward the end of the 2,000, 6,000 years that man has dominion on the earth with dominion Satan is enjoying presently where we are now we are 2017 years in the Judean calendar that we are using till now 2017 years after the birth of Christ added to the 4,000 years the world had lasted before Christ was born. How many years? 6,017 years. But the Roman Catholic monk Julian that invented the calendar that is giving us the years and the days and the months that we are using today made a miscalculation modern science with modern equipment has proved that he made a miscalculation between four and six years so the world right now should be 2021 years after christ was born or 2023 years between 2021 and 2023 so the total years the earth has lasted the world has lasted the dominion of man has lasted is 6,000 and 21 to 6,023 years. So the 6,000 years have completely elapsed. We are already 21 to 23 years after the thing has elapsed. That means what we are enjoying now is extra time. The world is supposed to have been wrapped up the end of the present system of things in the world where human beings are in charge and the devils have taken over from them and are now in charge should have ended but in keeping with god's principles the principles of god he allows some extra time to compensate for some mistakes and for some things that could be should be corrected just like he told abraham very distinctly that the seed of Abraham were to be pilgrims or strangers in a foreign land for 400 years. Ten years to the end of that 400 years, he had re, uh, 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 made a man, Moses, to come to the place where he will be able to achieve his purpose in taking Israel out of Egypt. But Moses was rash Moses was too quick and in the process he killed an Egyptian and the whole thing became bad he ran away and stayed for 40 years in exile 10 years to the time God spoke passed Moses was still in exile and stayed for 30 extra years before coming back to execute the exodus and eventually because of such injury the 
time of Israel in Egypt lasted for 430 years instead of 400 years. The 30 years constitute the extra time. It is like the game of football. I always illustrate this extra time with the game of football. In football, the full time of play is 90 minutes. But the 90 minutes should be continuous play. But sometimes the, the ball goes out of the pitch. And the, some time is taken before it is brought back. Sometimes there is a, a, a very hard charging and there will be a foul play. The ball will be stopped. Somebody may get injured. The game will be stopped. He will either be quickly massaged and he continues. Or they will ask for people to carry him out of the pitch and the game continues. The time that is lost has to be compensated at the expiration of the full 90 minutes. That extra time that is added after the full 90 minutes is to compensate for the time lost when the ball went out of the pitch, when it went over the bar, when the ball, there was foul play and some time was uh, lost. That is what is supposed to do to compensate for the lost time. That's why that extra time is also called injury time. Right now in the world, there are 21 to 23 years already into the injury time, into the extra time. And we do not know how long that extra time will last. Because in the game of football, there are three referees. The center referee and the two outside referees, one on this side of the field, the other on the other side. Sometimes they are called linesmen, but they are full referees. They govern the match with the center referee. Now, they can decide that there is a foul play which the center referee didn't see. And they will raise their flag and show him there is a foul play there and he will blow the whistle, even though he didn't see it. They can tell him this, this uh, somebody has taken the ball that went out of play to throw it in. But then the line referee that was near there when the ball went out of the pitch knew exactly whose leg it touched last. So when the wrong person is taking it, he will wave that the thing is wrong. And the center referee will say no, give it out to the other person. So three of them are all involved in officiating the match. But when it comes to the duration, the extra time will last. The two outside referees are not involved. It is only the center referee that determines the time to give for the extra time. He just announces it and tells it to these other people and that was it. He doesn't consult with them. And that is why Jesus said the exact time of his coming, he said the angels don't know. He said he, the son, does not know. It is only in the power of the father. He is the center referee. He is the person that determines the length of the extra time. So, we do not know how many more years the father has put in his own power to add to the 21 to 23 years we have already stayed outside the full expiration of 6,000 years. We don't know whether it's one year, whether it's six months, but by the time we look at the events that Jesus talked about and the predictions of scripture, we will now know whether we should take our time and uh, be doing some things because there is still time or we should now be in earnest praise the lord so when something should last for six thousand years and it has lasted for six thousand and seventeen eighteen or twenty one or twenty three years can we describe that period as the last of uh, the 6,000 year period can we eh? of course the 6,000 years are already expired so these are the very last days of the stay of man on earth so when we say the last days you should know by chronology 
by the number of years we have stayed on earth that we are actually in the last days. By simple arithmetic, these are the last days. So, what are the prophecies, what are the predictions concerning the last days? What did the spirit of prophecy say concerning them? In Daniel chapter 2, we can read, write so that you can read fully from verse 1 to 45. But because of our time, we want to read from verse 31. The dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had. From verse 1 to 45, you get the full story. But we are reading from verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form of it was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thigh of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest until a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then were the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36, this is the dream. And we will tell its interpretation before the king. Thou, O king, art the king of kings, for the God of heaven had given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven has he given into thy hand, and had made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the head of gold. 39. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of bronze, which shall be a rule over the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but shall not adhere one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and they shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, and the clay, the silver, and the gold, and the great God had made known to thee, O king, what shall come to pass hereafter? And the dream is certain, and the interpretation of it sure. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, from verse 1, to verse 28, but we are not going to read all. That's the full story. In the first year of Belshazzar, verse 1, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four wings of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, divers one from another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like a bear, and it raised up itself from one side, and it had 
three ribs in the mouth of it between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another beast, like a leopard, which had upon its back four wings of a fowl, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong and exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with its feet. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. In chapter 8, and... Uh, Verse 15 to verse 23 and 24. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Oli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for the time of the end shall this vision be. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright and said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time I pointed, the end shall be. Verse 20. The ram which thou sowest, having two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn that is between his eyes is its first king. Now, that being broken, whereas four stood up in it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation but not in his power and in the latter time of their kingdom when the transgressors are come to a fool a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and continue and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people and through his policy also he shall cause deceit to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Joining these scriptures together, we see that from the sixth century before the birth of Christ, about 3,400 years after the dominion of man started. It pleased God through the spirit of prophecy to begin to make man understand that the tenor of his dominion on earth was coming to an end. And he chose to reveal this thing first and foremost to a mighty king that was ruling the world as then. That was the second attempt that man had made since the creation of man in establishing a world dominion. The first attempt was also made in that same geographical area. In the book of Genesis chapter 11, during the time of Nimrod, the mighty hunter, he made an attempt in gathering all the people together to establish a kingdom where one man will be ruling all the people of the world. And then began a very ambitious and rebellious project called the tower that had its height to reach the heavens. God, you know the story, how he confounded them and stopped that project. And that was the Tower of Babel. That was the first attempt at a man gathering the whole world to rule over them. The second attempt was by Nebuchadnezzar, the same geographical area called Babel. He rose up and dominion was given to him. 
and he began to conquer various nations. About 127 known countries of the world then were under his dominion. And uh, he beautified Babylon. He was given the vision because in Babylon was the center of civilization then. He had the, the literary know-how. He had the language. He had it in written form. He had the technology to preserve written documents. And so God chose to give him the vision so that it will be, it will be written down and preserved for generations to come. That is the reason we are able to get the knowledge of the dream a man had. So in that dream, he showed him an image, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the belly of bronze, the legs of iron. Toward the, the end of the legs, the iron became mixed, became mixed with clay. And then, how that a stone came from the mountains, it wasn't caught by any hand, the thing landed on the toes and devastated that image that the wreckage came from the foot and all through to the head, the thing broke into pieces and it was found no more. Then that stone began to increase and increase and fill the whole earth and remain there. The same vision, the same information was given to Daniel who was sent to give the interpretation to this king and it was all written down. He had interpreted that the head of that image, the gold, was Babylon. He said, Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, Babylon, represents the head of gold. He said, after it, an inferior nation will arise and overcome them. And that is the chest of uh, silver. Because the chest has two hands attached to it, it will be a union of two nations that will now rule the Medes on the one hand and the Persians on the other hand. And then they overcame the kingdom of Babylon and they established a world rule. He said after that, there will be another kingdom of bronze. And that one is the Grecian kingdom. The interpretation was given by the angels. They called these nations by name. They are all written down. The Babylonian kingdom, the first one. In the vision given to Daniel, it was the lion, an animal, the, the king of all the beasts that was used to uh, typify that kingdom. Now, the vision given to Nebuchadnezzar described the kingdoms in their glory. Describe the kingdoms in their splendor. Describe the kingdoms in the level of uh, the, 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 the things of the world that uh, they will amass. The wealth, the glory that they will have. While the vision given to Daniel described the animals representing the kingdoms. These animals were animals of, uh, they were predators. They were animals that will eat up other animals. So, the information given to Nebuchadnezzar depicted the splendor and glory of the kingdoms. While the information given to Daniel depicted the rapacity of the kingdoms, their ability to crush, to take by force, to rule by force, to subdue other people, subject them, to pummel them, to bring them, whether they like it or not, under their rule. So those were the animals that were used to depict the kingdom to show their destructive abilities, their rapacity. So, the head of gold, the brightest and the most splendid of the kingdoms, also the, the, the lion, the king of the beasts, the chest of silver, and uh, the beer, representing the medo kingdom, inferior to the Babylonian kingdom, but because the dominion had been given to them, they had to overcome the Babylonian kingdom and began to rule. We know the story. How the last kingdom, king of Babylon was eating and drinking with his concubines and the vessels they used 
were the vessels that they had recovered from the house of God in Jerusalem. And he was drinking wine with his concubines and wives, with the vessels of gold and silver that were taken from the house of God. And you know how that a hand now wrote on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ufasim. And then the interpretation was given by Daniel. The Bible said that same night, while they were still in the arena, the armies of the Medes and Persians had surrounded the city and they battered and fought against them that night and the kingdom fell. The Medes and Persians took over and then began to do the things that they needed to do. You know how that it was during the Medes and Persian rule that Israel was now liberated to go back to their land, having fulfilled the 70 years in captivity and all those things. After that, the Bible said that the kings of the Medes and Persians will increase in splendor, increase in glory, increase in, in uh, affluence by silver, by gold, and they will be bragging and exhibiting these things, and they will attract the, the, the attention and the, the, the ire of uh, the king of Greece. That was exactly what happened. At the peak of their glory, the a very young army general in the army of Greece. Those of us that uh, did elementary history know about the, the Carthaginians and the Spartans. Know about their, their, their strong will. It was at that time that Alexander the Great, a 25-year-old man, became the army general of Greece. And he began to fight. He was attracted to the glory and splendor and the affluence and riches of the Medo-Persians, and he invaded them and conquered them. His uh, conquest was so swift. It, it, in, the, in the vision given to Daniel, the Grecian kingdom was uh, pictured by a leopard. A leopard is a very swift animal. So the conquest of Alexander Grace was very swift. He conquered them, but his reign, as recorded in Daniel chapter 7, was very short. And before you know it, he drank and drank and drank. One day, he drank himself dead. He just dropped dead. After drinking and drinking and becoming drunk, he died. And the Bible says, now out of that horn, four other horns came up. And that was exactly what happened. The four of his generals took over and split the kingdom into four kingdoms, into Syria, Egypt, Macedonia, and the fourth kingdom of uh, the present day Turkey. That's the, the, the area of the fourth kingdom. And they began to rule. So out of the kingdom of Greece, four different kingdoms now had dominion and they began to rule over the world. These were predictions, these were prophecies by the spirit of prophecy. These were revelations that we are made that literally came to pass in their times. Then the Bible said, after the third kingdom, said the fourth one was diverse from the, from the rest. It was very different. In fact, he didn't mention the name of the animal. He said the animal was dreadful. It was very different. He said the teeth of that animal were iron. It wasn't uh, ordinary teeth. They were iron. It was so dreadful, so strange. And then they conquered this other one, but he said the power that they used, it was not their own power that they used to subdue the world. It was not their own power. But they had, they had deceit. They had deceit prospering in their reign. They were able by deceit, by cunning, to get the whole world subdued and led the whole world into terrible atrocities. That's the fourth kingdom. Say it was dreadful, it was fierce, it was ruled by, by terrible force. It is this fourth kingdom that we are interested in. Because the Bible says it is in the last four kingdoms, I mean the fourth kingdom, that the stone came from the mountains, caught without hand, and devastated the toes and then the entire system of uh, 
human government on the world, of the world were completely broken. The fourth kingdom, the Bible also interpreted and revealed that it is the Roman kingdom. The fourth kingdom is the Roman kingdom. Rome eventually conquered the fragmented Grecian kingdom and took over the world rule in the year 168 BC. By 168, the Roman kingdom came into being, the last of the four kingdoms. Shortly, you remember that in the image shown unto Nebuchadnezzar, the last kingdom was two legs of iron. Now, it, it, it didn't last long. They, they had extended their borders and their conquest so wide that it became difficult to maintain law and order in all the very vast world dominion. So, an emperor known as Emperor Diocletian decided to divide the empire into the eastern and the western empire, thus fulfilling the Bible prophecy that the kingdom has two legs. So, the two empires continued. The western empire had its capital at Rome, while the eastern empire had its capital at Byzantium or Constantinople, presently located in Turkey. They continued like that until about the sixth century after Christ, precisely about 538 AD, when the power of the Eastern Roman Empire began to wane. The Western Empire also passed through a lot of crises and complex political maneuvering until the Bishop of Rome gradually emerged as the ruling despot, being able to now install kings in this nation, king in that nation, dethrone the other one there, and by his authority, he now began to rule. It was uh, an emperor by name Constantine the Great. There were a number of Constantines that ruled as emperors in Rome, but there is a particular one known as Constantine the Great that appointed the Bishop of Rome to hold sway for him in the Western Empire. While he himself went to Byzantium, it was him that renamed it Constantinople. So, a lot of, a lot of uh, diverse political maneuverings now took place. But from 538 AD, when the Bishop of Rome began to really exercise lordship over the kings of France, king of Spain, king of Portugal, king of Germany, king of, uh, of Britain, and all the places, according to the names they were answering that time, he enjoyed the authority of a world ruler. But then, there was war between France and Spain, and one Spanish soldier, a Roman Catholic by name Ignatius Loyola, Loyola, was terribly wounded. But this man was a very brilliant military chap. So the French commander became very interested in the man, even though it was, uh, he was from the enemy army. He took note of him and brought him to be healed of that is deadly wound on the leg by his own personal physician. After the wound was healed, he sent him home to Spain without hurting him because he admired his military wizardry. When he reached home, Ignatius Loyola could not fit into the army again, so he began to do some spiritual exercises. He entered into spiritism. Ignatius Loyola eventually in the year 1536, he founded a spiritual order known as the Society of Jesus. This order was strange. Their activities were strange from normal church activities that people knew. So initially, the Roman Catholic authority rejected the order. Loyola was arrested. Later, he was released. And after that, he visited the Pope in Rome, threw himself at the feet of the Pope, and uh, made peace with the Pope. The Pope 
Now, later, by the year 1540, accepted the Society of Jesus of uh, the, the order that was founded by Loyola. It was officially accepted into the Roman Catholic Church in the year 1540. And it was approved to be the intelligence group to consolidate the military arm of the church as well as help to propagate the faith of the Roman Catholic Church. This Society of Jesus became catapulted into prominence by the time Pope Paul III assumed office as Pope. By this time, John Wycliffe and the reformers, Tyndale, William Tyndale and the rest of them, uh, Martin Luther, all their reforms had begun and uh, a lot of commotion had uh, happened in the church and people had begun to read the Bible and the reformation was on, the revival was on. The Lutheran church was born, a number of other groups like that were and the church needed to bring these people back. So, they convened a council known as the Council of Trent. Trent because it was in the town called Trent. So, in the year 1545, that council began and ended in the year 1563. They invited the Jesuit order and uh, made them to, to now be the official intelligence arm of the church. Like USA has the CIA and Israel has the, the Mossad. Uh, every nation has its own intelligence group that will go into the places and get intelligence security reports. And by those reports and by those intelligence uh, espionage work they do, they will be able to preserve the government and counter insurgencies and the troubles that will arise, nipping them at the board. So that's what they engaged the Jesuit order to now be in the Catholic Church in the year 1545 at the Council of Trent. That made them become very powerful in the church. And... Uh, this specific assignment, they were told to infiltrate into the groups, the reformers' groups, to work with them, infiltrate, go into among them, and they bring them back under the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, under the authority of the Pope. So they took charge immediately, and they, be they began a wave of persecution against Christians, against the Protestants, against the people that were in the reformers group, they began a wave of persecution that was unprecedented. Even the time that pagan Rome was persecuting Christians at the first century, it was not like that. It is estimated that between 50 million and 100 million Protestants were killed during the era of the Inquisition that was, uh, that was uh, under the charge of the Jesuit order. There has not been at any time in history any such number of people of genuine Christians killed. People were forced to deny Christ and if they said no, they would be burnt at the stake and a number of other things we are done. So, the, the Inquisition ended. We want to, we are coming to understanding the events of the last days. We have seen the predictions by the spirit of prophecy, the four kingdoms. We have seen how that the four kingdoms have literally come according to the spirit of prophecy. The Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the kingdom of Greece, and the Roman kingdom. These are the four empires that will rule the world. 
And the Bible says it is at the reign of the Roman kingdom, the fourth, the fourth uh, kingdom that the, the ancient of days will take over the realm. Praise the Lord. After the Inquisition, the Jesuit order became abhorred because they were very ruthless. They, they dealt so with the people. There was a particular incident I read. The cousin of uh, King Philip of Spain had become converted and was reading the Bible. A pregnant woman. And uh, the thing blew open. It was reported and she was brought before the panel made of uh, Jesuit priests and the prelates and bishops. And they judged her and commanded her to recant. She refused. And then a public execution was, uh, was uh, arranged for her. And King Philip was made to sit and to watch the gruesome murder of uh, his cousin. This woman that was pregnant was stretched along uh, the floor and uh, a, a very thick uh, rope like a uh, cord was stretched and uh, sharp objects like razor blade, like, uh, like uh, nails were tied along the line of the rope. And then something was used to hold the woman's mouth open as it was stretched on the floor, the belly bulging with child. And then water was uh, dripping from up and the rope was being put. And uh, as she, she, the, the mouth was open and the rope was being lowered and water was coming, the water would fill the throat, involuntarily she would swallow. And then the swallowing would draw in the rope with the bone, with the, the, the nail, with the razor, everything was going. And as she was swallowing, the thing was entering and entering until it reached the stomach. Then somebody drew it with force from this end and threw it out and the stomach came out from the mouth. That's just an illustration of the kind of cruelty. So after the Inquisition, when a number of things happened and the wave of Inquisition died down, many of the nations rose against the Jesuits. They branded them wicked, they branded them satanic. In fact, Portugal became the first country to expel the Jesuits from their land. Portugal expelled the Jesuits and then France followed suit. A number of, uh, a number of them, they became, they became very, very unpopular, very, very abhorred, and uh, on and on until the Catholic Church itself became uh, so badly affected the, as a result of that. The Catholic Church banned the Jesuit order. In the year 1773, by July 1st, Pope Clement XIV dissolved the Jesuit order. He dissolved the Jesuit order, but it didn't go down well. The Jesuits could not take it. A number of things happened, but finally they poisoned Pope Clement XIV and he died. The death of Pope Clement XIV marked the decline of the Papa Rome. Remember, the form of the last empire, as pictured to Daniel, was a beast, diverse from all other beasts. So, it began as pagan Rome. The emperor of Rome had three offices fused into one. He was the political head. He was also the religious head, the chief priest of the pagan room. He was also a god. He was one of the gods that would be worshipped in Rome. So it was like that until the Diocletian, Imperial Diocletian divided the empire into two and they continued like that. The one in Rome continued to be the, the Pontifex Maximus, the, the chief priest of Rome, continued to be a god and continued to be the political head until 
Constantine the Great involved the Bishop of Rome. Now the thing began to change color. But this time the Emperor was still at, Const at Constantinople and the whole thing was still blending. But when the Eastern Empire fell and the Western Empire came under the authority of the Bishop of Rome, it became necessary that he should now adjudicate both for the Christians and the pagans and also in the political office. So the pagans demanded that he should either take up the office of the chief priest of their pagan gods or he should resign. Another person would take over. For him to remain, he had to accept that office. That is why till today, the Pope has the office and the title of Pontifex Maximus or the chief priest of the pagan gods of Rome. He is the chief priest. He accepted it in order to retain his position. And then he continued. All the practices of the pagans were now brought into the church and baptized. They were now named, given Christian names. The gods of Rome were now given to be saints. And the days of their worship were now christened saints' days. A number of things happened. So the admixture of paganism and Christianity under one person is what today is known as the Roman Catholic Church. But that Roman Catholic Church is not just a church mixing paganism with Christianity. It is also a secular authority. It is also a political power because it inherited the seat of the Emperor of Rome, the Fourth World Empire. It inherited the seat. So it was a world despot from 538 AD. It began to exercise rulership over other nations and continued like that until this time that the Jesuits were banned from the church. The Jesuits now went underground and began to work to demolish the church. They had grown so powerful, they had grown so great, they now vowed to take revenge on the church to bring it to its knees. So by the time they were banned, they went underground. And it was the time that the superior general of the Jesuits was a man whose uncle was a bishop. He was the person in charge of the Jesuit order that year, Superior General Ricky. The year was the year 1776. The superior general Ricky now gathered his people and they had to form another group. You know what happens in the, in the campuses. Whenever a secret court is unveiled and uh, discovered and the authority comes hard against them, what they usually do is to go underground, regroup and come out with another name. I hope you know that. That's exactly how they do. And that is what the Jesuit order did. They went underground and now regrouped and formed another group known as the Illuminatis. How many of us have heard of Illuminatis before? The group called the Illuminatis was formed on May 1, 1776 by the Jesuit order under the superior general Ricky, they created the Illuminati and uh, they used one able soldier of theirs, Adam Wellslop, and uh, patterned it after the structure and operation of the Jesuit order. The Illuminati in its operation, the Illuminati in its ambition, the Illuminati in its uh, operation and structure is just exactly like the Jesuit order. But it has one difference. Their major difference is that the Illuminatis were commissioned to work among the secular political entities. The Jesuit order was working inside the church. 
and they had been given ultimatum at the Council of Trent to infiltrate all the other churches and bring them to the authority of Rome. Now the Illuminatis came up, their main ambition was to infiltrate into all the governments of the world and bring all the governments of the world under the authority of the superior general of uh, the Jesuits. That was the ambition. This took off in 1776 when they, uh, when they started. The, the next year, 1777, they joined together with the worldwide Freemasons. There was the occult group known as Freemasons. They joined together with them in 1777 through the, Mason, the Masonic Baron of the House of Rothschild. This uh, Grand Orient Masonic Lodge was one of the greatest occultic group in the world then. You may have heard of the name Rothschild. That name is still in, in, in authority till today because it is a, a family that rose up in the Middle Ages and took hold of, uh, of, of, of the occultic order of the Freemasons, a very rich, very rich family. They have refused to lose their identity that till today, they are still ruling all the economies of the world, this Rothschild family. In order not to lose their identity, they marry themselves from generation to generation. They marry themselves to make sure that their wealth revolves around the family. They have a major share in the central bank, the Reserve Bank of America. You know that Nigeria Central Bank is a government establishment, but America Central Bank is a private company. The Rothschild has a major share. The Vatican City has a major share. And that is why, the, even though America is predominantly a Protestant nation, the Roman Catholic Church has a major say in what happens and in the very few days, very few months, very few years ahead, you will see how America will serve the, that uh, uh, entity. So, it was in 1777, they now joined forces with them, joined the Masonic uh, uh, Baron of the House of Rothschild. Now, by 1789, they decided to move into action. The first place they entered into and tested their ability was France. France at that time was 100% Roman Catholics. And France, France was uh, under a kind of economy that was terribly uh, capitalist. The majority of the people were very poor. Only few people, the bishops, the barons, the, 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 the knights, and most of them prelates of the Roman Catholic Church were the landowners. Every other citizen of France was farming for them. The Illuminatis now instigated the masses in France and instigated them until they arose in a massive revolt. Something in history known as the French Revolution. The masses came up, but they didn't come up on their own. The Illuminatis instigated them. And then they came up, rose up against their, 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 their government, killed the people, all in government, all that had money, all the millionaires, all the bourgeois, everybody that had substance was killed and blood was flowing on the streets. They, they confiscated all their properties, their lands and everything that those barons had. And at the end, Napoleon Bonaparte emerged as the new French leader. Having installed him, the Illuminatis now instructed him to 
exterminate the papal line and the papal authority of Rome. This was to take their revenge. The Jesuit order, when they were banned by Pope Clement XIV, they could not take it. Even though they poisoned him and he died, but they wanted to take their revenge. So they finally had it after the Illuminati toppled the government of France and took over and installed Napoleon Bonaparte. Now they instructed him to go and destroy and exterminate the authority of the Church of Rome. Napoleon Bonaparte sent his army general, General Alexander Badia, sent him into Rome. And in 1798, precisely on February 10, the man marched into Italy, conquered Italy, entered Rome, and abolished the papal political government. He established a secular government in Italy and they took the Pope captive and they brought him chained to France. The Pope was chained and brought to France and he died there. And they abolished every authority of uh, the papacy or the church of Rome. This was the end of the reign of the papacy at the year 1798. I want us to remember that one of the beasts that denoted the last world empire that we rule said it had ten horns, but one major horn that came up uprooted three others and then had a deadly wound and was as though it had completely died. But surprisingly, the deadly wound was healed. So, that was what happened. Remember, the pagan Rome, the Roman Empire, had transformed, has transformed into a religious one, headed by the Pope. But ruling over the nations, ruling over the kingdoms. But by 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte of France brought that to an end when he conquered Italy and seized the Pope and abolished his uh, authority. When that was done, all the other popes that we are elected in the Roman Catholic Church, the one that replaced the one that was taken to France to die, they remained quiet in the Vatican. They remained there in their headquarters, in their offices. They never exercised any world authority again. That was how they continued until that uh, in the year 1814, the Jesuit order was restored. The Pope that was in charge then restored the Jesuit order and gave them a charge like the charge that was given them in 14, uh, 1545 at the Council of Trent to bring back all the dissidents, all the places that had uh, revolted, to bring them back. Eleven years after their restoration, all the henchmen of the Jesuit order and of the Illuminatis, they met at a college in northern Italy, College of Chenri, near the city of Toro in northern Italy. And there, they plotted to create a new world order. That was the year 1825. They plotted to create a new world order. And the aim of the new world order will be to bring back the authority of the Church of Rome and uh, to make the Pope to control the world again. They vowed to destabilize any government that stood in their way. At that meeting, it was agreed that Protestantism must be utterly abolished. So, the Illuminatis were sent to work on the governments of the world 
and the Jesuits were sent to work on the religions of the world. That was how from 1825 they went on and went on and went on. In 1918, the Pope made a call. In line with the new world order, he called on all the governments of the world, though himself was not a head of government. He called on all of them to unite after the First World War that they must come together Otherwise, that the world will be wiped away by war. That they should come together and fight against the axis of evil. Any group that wants to do anything contrary, they will unite and they suppress it. That is how the world will go and no peace. They all accepted. And the League of Nations was formed. That was the first attempt at bringing to practical reality the new world order that was conceived in 1825. In 1918, the thing began by the formation of the League of Nations. But then, having formed the League of Nations, it became necessary that the Pope also should have secular political authority. So, after the war, the Italy that had begun to have fragmentations after the defeat of France, they became fragmented. This group, northern part, western part, eastern part, they couldn't agree again. They were not one country anymore. Now, there was a wave of nationalism in Italy, and they wanted to come together again to become one country. We remember there is a phrase that is going on even used about Nigeria today, that Nigeria is a mere geographical expression. That was exactly how Italy was described or being described prior to their coming together as one nation again. So the nationalists began to bring, call all the other people together to unite again and to form a country as it was before that could be formidable in power. When they started, the Roman Catholic Church opposed it. They opposed it because if Italy could have a secular authority, that means that the Pope would be perpetually be under another head of state. When originally, from 538 AD, the Pope had enjoyed authority over kings, over kingdoms, over nations. They long to return to that place of authority. So they opposed Italy becoming one nation again. The opposition was so fierce because Italy was almost 100% Roman Catholics. In the year 1929, when uh, Mussolini was in charge. He was uh, the person that was in charge, championing the, the one united Italy. They had to call the people, the officers, and uh, the men of the Roman Catholic Church to a roundtable conference to discuss the matter. They came together in a conference known as the Lateran Conference, uh, named after the city that the conference took place in Italy. So, as they came together, they, they thought and they talked until they came to a compromise. What compromise was that? The Italian government accepted to give Roman Catholic Church the status of a political entity, the status of a nation. And the Roman Catholic Church accepted to allow Italy to unite and be one autonomous entity, political entity. Now, the way to do it, they now said the city, we are the headquarters of the 
the church was located, Vatican City, would now be declared an independent sovereign nation. Why the rest of Italy will be under Mussolini? It was agreed and signed. So, the 44 hectares of land housing the Vatican headquarters of the church was declared a political entity, an independent state. That was in the year 1929. 1929 saw the emergence of the Papa Rome again return to political power. Remember, in the year 1789, the thing was uh, abolished by Napoleon Bonaparte. In the year 1929, Mussolini restored the political power and authority of the church. So, Papa Rome was reborn in the year 1929. And uh, the Vatican City was given the status of a sovereign state. The Vatican City, many of us that did uh, um, quiz and riddles and jokes in our primary schools, we know that is a common quiz that is always asked, what, which is uh, the smallest but richest country in the world? And the answer is Vatican City, the country of 44 hectares of land. That was how the, the impasse was uh, solved. So, the temporal power, political power, was now restored and uh, it was developed. From 1929, the Pope began to get more and more influence, more and more influence. In 1945, the Pope that was uh, there after the Second World War made another call and called all the nations together, this time now as a fellow head of state. He came with them and they called that all the nations should now unite, not just an association, not just a league of nations. They should now unite to form a more formidable force and have a stronger voice in controlling the world. And the United Nations was formed. It now moved from League of Nations, a loose association of nations, to a United Nations. That was when United Nations was formed in the month of October 1945. On and on, today, the new world order is moving forward and Pope Francis now is a voice that is calling on all the nations and is asking them all the nations should abandon their sovereignty, they should abandon their independence, they should abandon their their, their freeness, freedom, and embrace one city-state for the whole world. So that all the world will now be one country, ruled by only one man. That is the agenda, that is the last stage of the new world order that started in 1825. That is the last stage where it is now. And Pope Francis has already called for it. And the nations are now working toward it. If anybody listening to the address of uh, uh, Barack Obama, this last address to the United Nations, that was what he was uh, completely insisting upon. That the nations should come together and form one nation. It should be that... Uh, all the things, the problems of the world can come under control. The nations are calling for it right now. Now, why the Illuminatis, we are working to get all the nations together to come under the authority of Rome. Remembering that Rome is the fourth and the last world empire that will rule the world at the time Jesus would come. While Illuminatis we are working on the political entities, the nations, the Jesuits, we are still working on the religious groups. And in the year 
1999, all the religions of the world agreed to come together. And they came together and signed a treaty. They signed an agreement that all the religions of the world will now be one. They formed what is today known as the United Religions Organization, URO. The nations formed United Nations Organization, UNO, under the auspices of the Illuminati. While the Jesuits had worked on all the religions of the world, we all know that our own uh, Cardinal Arinze from Onicha, for very many years, was in charge of the ecumenism in Rome. He was the person in charge of reaching out to other religions. Some other people were in charge reaching out to the Protestant churches. So, in 1999, the Protestant churches came together and signed an agreement that there is no more anything to protest about. They declared the protest ended. And it was the Archbishop, uh, one Archbishop of uh, the Anglican Church that made the announcement to all the other Protestant churches that the protest of Luther has ended. The protest, the Lutheran Church worldwide signed agreement. The church, all other churches, the Baptist Church, every one of them, they were there were charismatic churches there. There were a lot of protesters there. They signed in 1999. Then in 2014, all the religions of the world gathered together in Seoul, South Korea. And there, they signed the agreement of the alliance of all religions. There, the Muslims were represented. The Buddhists were represented. The Hindus were represented. Roman Catholic Church was represented by the Archbishop of uh, the Philippines. The Anglican Church was represented by the Archbishop of Panama. A number of other denominations were there. They were fully represented. The Zoharastas were there. The Baha'i faith was there including the Jewish Judaism faith. They, there were rabbi that represented Judaism in that conference and they signed that all the religions of the world are now one. And one of the things they released as communique is that there was no more need for evangelism because every road from every religion you reach God. You go to heaven. There was no need to persuade a member of one religion to join your own religion because as he follows his own he will reach heaven as you follow your own you will reach heaven and they have signed and that was uh, in august 2014 in the city of seoul south korea with that done it is like mission accomplished we need to understand that the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 13 that there are going to be two beasts that are going to be functional at the time that Jesus, the end will come. Two beasts, one from the sea, one from the land. The one from the sea simply represents the sea of uh, people, languages, cultures that represents the religions. The one from the land represents the political entities. So these two beasts, as we see in Revelation 13, are now the ones that are right on the ground now. The first beast in Revelation 13 from verse 1 is the last beast of uh, the vision that was given to Daniel. The beast that was diverse from the others. It says, in the reign of that beast, then the end will be. The 
the Lord Jesus will come. Revelation 13 and verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, the same seven heads that Daniel saw on the beast in Daniel 7, and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, the feet was the feet of a bear, the mouth was the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, gave him his throne, and gave him great authority. So, you see that the fourth empire that Daniel saw, he said it was a strange beast. It was different, diverse from the other beasts. Diverse from the lion representing Babylon, diverse from the bear representing Medopatia, diverse from the, the leopard representing Greece. Said so the last one, the beast was so complex, complicated, strange. In Revelation 13, he says, that beast had the face of a lion, it had the feet of a bear, it had the mouth of a human, speaking like a man. The feet were the feet of a bear, the mouth was the mouth of a lion, and uh, the, the, it looked like a leopard. It was a strange beast, a mixture of so many things put together. He says, that beast, the dragon, in Revelation 12, we know that the dragon is that old serpent called the devil, called Satan. That's the, who the dragon is. So the devil gave that beast. He said he gave him his throne. He gave him his uh, power. He gave him great authority. And I saw one of his heads as though it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed just like the horn was also wounded in the picture given to Daniel. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon who gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with her? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man has ear, let him hear. Verse 11, I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. He has two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Exercising the power of the face beast before him, caused the earth and them that dwell in it to worship the face beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, in so much that fire came down from heaven on the earth. And uh, verse 16, he caused all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and enslaved, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell except he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. The Bible says that there are seven kings describe the seven kings and another king, the eighth king. In the book of Revelation 17, he said the eighth king is of the seven. Now, this beast is a strange beast taken from the kingdoms of the world. Taken from the kingdoms of the world. You see, the kingdom of uh, Babylon is one, kingdom of Medopatia, two, then Grecian kingdom split into four, four plus the first two, that is uh, six. And the seventh king is the kingdom of Rome. But it was pagan Rome under the Caesars, under the the pagan kings. But the present system of the kingdom of Rome is no longer in the pagan 
uh, emperors, but in the papal emperor. But he said the eighth, the eighth king is of the seven. The seventh king is the Roman emperor. But this, this eighth one now, the papal king, he said is of the seven. He doesn't have a different dominion. It's still the same Roman dominion. I don't know whether I am being understood. So, now, from the time the deadly wound was healed, in 1929, till now, there are eight popes that have been in the Roman Catholic Church. Eight of them. And... In the same way, we see that out of this eight, the eighth one, Pope Francis, is still of the seven. Because Benedict is not dead. He's still there. It was his own papacy that he relinquished and gave, up, gave to Benedict, I mean to Francis. If you count them from the time they revived and came back to the world dominion. Eight popes have ruled. The eight of them have actually only seven dominions. The one Francis is holding is the dominion of uh, Benedict. So the eight is of the seventh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible says in the same book of Revelation that there are ten kings that receive authority one hour with the, with the beast, but they don't have thrones yet. That they are the people that will be ruling the world at the time that the ancient of days will hold meeting in heaven and take over the dominion. In 1976, the Club of Rome shared the world, divided the world into 10 administrative districts. And these 10 administrative districts will be how the world will be ruled when finally the entire stage is taken over. When the nations abandon their sovereignty, the world has already been divided since 1976 into 10 administrative districts. That is the reason all the European nations are coming together and they formed the European Union. They have one parliament. They have one currency. They have one law. You get, you, it's a time will come when Everything, all the things done in all the member nations will just be one. That's one administrative unit. I have the map of uh, the administrative units. The African Union, that used to be called Organization of African Unity, a loose association of African states, has transformed into Africa. Soon, it will have the same currency, and all the nature of European Union. There is the North America. There is the South America. There is uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the, all that. There is uh, the, the, the South Pacific Union. There is uh, the Union that will take care of uh, the eastern part of Asia and the western part of Asia. That's how they divided the whole world into ten administrative units and each administrative unit will be under one king remember the two legs finally ended in ten toes remember it is at the time of the ten toes those kings he said those toes are ten kings at the time of those ten kings that the stone that was cut with their hand will land on them and devastate them and then we take over. If you read the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will see that the present system of things in the world was so arranged by God and it has a time, time frame. 
He said, at the time, everything is, uh, is, uh, uh, is done that Jesus Christ will come and he will bring down every authority, every rule, every power under him. And then the last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. So when he will have destroyed that last enemy, he will return the kingdom back to God. So that God the Father will now be all and in all. That time is shortly coming. And we want to show that there is something that the worry should be able to do. And that's the final point we are taking. We see the joining together of the nations. All their programs... Very fine, very wonderful. If you read the Bible, where we read, it talks about that that beast was glorious. It was speaking and doing very marvelous things, but it enslaved the whole world and made them to worship the beast, worship the dragon. That is why the United Nations is talking about eradicating sickness, eradicating poverty, eradicating hunger, eradicating very wonderful programs that they are carrying out. If you have tuberculosis, you don't need to worry again. The United Nations is bankrolling research on it. And they are also bankrolling treatment on it. You'll be treated free of charge. If you are having leprosy, no need to worry. The drugs are free of charge. It is bankrolled by the United Nations. They want the world to be disease free. Polio is almost non-existent anymore because they sponsored the the researchers, they are the people that made all the things possible. And when you look at it, it is very wonderful, it is very great. The Food and Agricultural Organization, the Ministry of Agriculture of the New World Government, has come out with a blueprint of how to eradicate hunger from the whole world. Their coordinator after mapping out the food situation in the world and all the world population and the world population densities in various places, they came out with a, a blueprint saying that the present food available in the world is more than enough to feed every human being on earth without any person going hungry. That they have mapped out redistribution strategies that redistribution will make it possible that places where they have arid land, they can't grow enough crops, they will have enough food to eat and to spare. That they have made the distribution possible, but that they are waiting for the political will to enforce it. Meanwhile, nations that produce excess food like America, they carry the excess and pour into the Pacific Ocean. But the Food and Agricultural Organization says when they receive the political will, they will enforce redistribution of the food so that all the people begging on the streets will not stop begging. They will be provided for by the government, one world government of the world. A number of things because the nation's economy are tied to specific currencies of countries, there is now a movement across the world economies to create one common currency for the whole world. It was China, the central bank governor of China, that muted the idea and pushed it when there was a crash in the economy in a few years ago, when there was uh, some banks that crashed in 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 U.S. and uh, the real estate sector also crashed, he muted the idea. The thing is gaining ground now. It's gaining ground that instead of denominating other currencies with the dollar, we create one world currency, and every other currency will be denominated to it. Without one currency, one person falls there or not, it doesn't affect the economy. That's the move now, and they are pushing ahead. 
it is necessary for us to recognize that by the time by the time these things come into place you now want to ask with all these good things why is the united nations a bad thing now they now want remember the bible says they will want to cause every person free and enslaved poor or rich to serve the beast and to worship the dragon that is the aim of the united nations organization why they are dangling a lot of goodies to make the world disease free to make the world hunger free to make the world every person gets a good thing and all that to eradicate war and all that they are also pushing that every person in the world will be a sinner will continue to commit sin until he dies that is the reason they have taken charge of the education of the world you know that what you teach a child is what the nation will be so the curriculum of the world they have drawn up what they call the world school curriculum and they have a passion for that very sin that is going to drown the world the evil of immorality that is the sin that the devil has earmarked to use to drown the world into perdition physical immorality and spiritual immorality physical immorality is sexual immorality and uh, the things associated with it spiritual immorality is idolatry that is why today there is a lot of spiritism today in many universities yoga is a compulsory course today there are very many things in some places they are teaching witchcraft as a course today sex sex sexology is a course in fact you have you have sexology in first degree sexology in master's degree sexology in phd And they are pushing all the things out now there is a compulsory course for all the children in the world and that course is known as sexuality education it is supposed to be started according to them from primary three through to university and according to the world school curriculum the specific objective of that course is to remove from the mind of the children from the mind of the populace the erroneous notion especially as taught by Christians that sex is sin that is the primary objective which was stated in the book of sexuality education to make human beings now have freedom to sex from age six and to remove anything from their mind that will make them feel that it is sin that is why in the so-called uh, developed nations where they have adopted this curriculum any child can wake up any morning and uh, and talk about having sex the mother cannot say no the father cannot say no the boyfriend will come he will introduce to the mother and they will go in the girlfriend will come that's just that in the school that is just that there was a girl that the mother brought from uk to this school the girl resisted it but eventually she stayed 
and we were monitoring her. We were trying to make her to adjust. After one time in this place, the girl came to me and sat down and said, Sir, I now see why my mother brought me from London to come and school here. I see that my mother does not want me to get damaged. He said, for this one time I have stayed here, the things that I have learned, the things I have seen from the Bible studies and everything, I now see why my mother brought me here. He said, if I had been in the UK, I have been monitoring my friends. A number of them have taken in two or three times and have committed abortion since this one time I am here and I should have been like them. The United Nations says you teach the child different things about sex, different things, homosexual uh, 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 type, lesbian type, masturbation, everything, teach him everything he knows about sexual, se sexual relationship. And tell him or her from age six, in fact, they have reduced it to three. So that you catch them young. Tell them there is no problem at all. There is no sin. Forget about Christians. And he says, you must remove the, everything they have learned from home. The teacher is under obligation to counter everything they have learned from home. This is the United Nations. Their agenda to prepare every soul to worship the beast. To worship the dragon. That is why they are using the nation's money to sponsor abortions worldwide. They are using the nation's money to sponsor homosexual marriages, gay marriages, female marrying female, male marrying male. Right now, what they are arguing is whether it should be made legal for human beings to marry animals. Some places have already legalized it. Some states in the U.S., you can marry any animal you like. In Germany, for instance, it is not a crime for a human being to lie with a beast. It's not a crime. In some countries, it is still a crime. It is evil. It is punishable. But in some others, it has been legalized. But now, they are discussing to make it a constitutional right. Like the gay marriage is now a constitutional right. Now, in America, the gay marriage was only made constitutional 2015. The Republicans have been rejecting it. They have been refusing it. Many Roman Catholics, both Republicans and the Democrats, have been rejecting it because the Roman Catholic Church has been against it. But the Pope came into power in 2013. And in 2015, he visited the Congress. He was invited because of the controversy of uh, the gay marriage bill and the abortion to legalize them. It was also to have a session of the United Nations National Assembly. So 23rd of September, he went with the Congress and he met with the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House had been hell-bent against the bill legalizing both gay marriage and uh, the abortion. But that night, Pope Francis met with the Speaker of the Congress of America and instructed him to pass the bill. In the morning, the Congress was to meet and then Pope Francis came and addressed them. After the address, the man could not go contrary to his conscience. There and then, he resigned. 
a new person was elected and the next day the bill was passed into law when pressmen approached him and they asked him about how on earth will he support gay marriage he, he retorted to them say God has not condemned them God has welcomed them who am I to reject them that was his reply when he was returning from one of his tours they asked him about heaven and hell how that the people that were into that will go to hell he told them that it is not possible that there should be a literal hell that the hell that they talk about is not a literal place of punishment not a literal place of fire that it is inconsistent with god's nature of love to have a place called hell there is no such thing they talked about creation he said the story of adam and eve is a fable remember the book of daniel said he will corrupt the nations he will corrupt them so he has announced a 25 point agenda of reforms within the roman catholic church it took off in december 8 2015 and he said he was going to complete it in the month of november 2016 and then in 2017 he said he's in a haste he said he doesn't have time he gave himself four to five years to complete his work he said when he completes it he will enter his father's house and many people have been trying to decode what he means by his father's house will he die will he resign what is he going to do but the bible says that that beast will be the person that will make peace between israel and the arab nations he will enter into covenant with them but in the midst of the year he will break that covenant and he will enter into the temple and present himself as god to be worshiped that same 2015 the pope announced that power was shifting from the vatican city he has lost the idea of relocating the headquarters of the church to jerusalem so that he will be there and then broker the peace between israel and their warring neighbors he requested for land from prime minister of israel netanyahu he refused him the palestinians who who take who are having eastern part of jerusalem gave him land it needs to be understood that the pope is the only human being that all the religions of the world including islam have accepted as their head they can take instructions from so by the time we talk about going to jerusalem because netanyahu refused him land on this december 24th 2016 the last national assembly of the united nations obama was going to attend as a president of america a resolution was taken against israel making them illegal to stay in any part of jerusalem in that resolution nations were to vote after they voted and majority said israel would go out of jerusalem remember the present situation is they divided jerusalem into two the western part is in the hand of israel the eastern part is in the hand of palestine but israel has been insisting that they want the whole jerusalem palestine insisting they want the whole jerusalem 
So when he refused land to the Pope to build the headquarters in Jerusalem, they now conspired. And Obama now worked against Israel at that, nation, at that, at that United Nations General Assembly. The resolution was passed that Israel should vacate the whole of Jerusalem. And now the only hope lay in any of the five security council members to veto it. The rule is any resolution passed at the general floor, if any one security council member vetoes it, that resolution will not stand. There are five permanent security members. United States of America, Britain, France, China, and Russia. China and Russia will always work together. But in any matter that concerns Israel, America will always protect Israel. That has been the tradition from 1948 that they came into existence as a nation again. But in this particular situation, because the Pope has been injured by Netanyahu refusing him land to build in Jerusalem, all the security members, Britain refused to veto it. France refused to veto it. America refused to veto it. Until all the five of them accepted the resolution and it was stamped as a law. So as I talk with you, it is illegal for Israel to take any foothold in Jerusalem. That is what is going to bring the problem. Because Netanyahu has refused that same day at the floor of the, nation, of, the, of the United Nations Assembly. He refused. And he said that he was rather going to shift his capital to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. Now, it was supposed to be that by this year, 2017, in the month of March, the project of Obamacare that provided Americans to receive the identification mark either in the forehead or in the right hand should have taken off. It was slated for March because under the permutations of the Illuminatis, under the workings of their underground strategies, the American presidency should have been handed over to Hillary Clinton to further the agenda and bring in the end. That was gazetted. And any person that followed the election knew that the election was given to Hillary. Every poll showed her winning. The popular vote gave her three point something million votes ahead of Trump. But because the electoral vote, Trump had overwhelming majority over her. And the American Constitution says, in the case one person wins the electoral vote and another person wins the popular vote, the person that wins the electoral vote is elected. That's their rule. And that was why Trump was elected. I want to let you know that America and the nations of the world constitute that beast that came from the earth that will force the world to worship the image of the beast. And the program is under the control of the Illuminatis because they are the people that have masterminded the United Nations. This program should have brought in Hillary Clinton to complete the agenda that Obama started. But in 2007, the spirit of prophecy spoke through a simple brother, an evangelist musician in the United States of America. By that time, Trump was just a businessman. He didn't have anything to do with politics. But by, by the spirit of prophecy, 
the Spirit of God said, I will raise up Trump to be my trumpet. I will raise up Trump to be my trumpet. Listen. Continuing in that prophecy, he says, I will fool the people. By the time you go, just go to YouTube. Google the prophecy about the electoral victory of Trump. You will see it come 2007. You will watch it. You will listen to it. In the prophecy, continue. He said, I will fool the people. I will fool the people. And God fooled the people and brought Trump into power. Now listen. Remember we are saying understanding the events of the last days. Why is the Trump presidency? Why the Trump presidency at this time? There is only one thing that is preventing the end from coming. The servant of God has talked about it over and over again. And he keeps saying that the world is waiting for us. Have you heard him say it before? And he keeps saying that God is waiting for us. Have you heard him say it before? Yes. Because that Jacob that has strayed away from God needs to be brought back. The nations that have not heard and the people that are yet in ignorance need to hear the true gospel, not the prosperity chaff. So, in the place we read in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the nations for a witness unto them. He said, after that, what happens? He said, then shall the end come. If Trump had not won, by now, Americans will have gone on with the test case of receiving the, the mark on their forehead and on their right hand. It is not that that is the mark of the beast or the Antichrist, no. But that is a test run. That program is not an American project. It is a global project. Because the company that invented the radio frequency identification device, RFID, that is going to be used. They were given the contract to produce two point, either 2.6 or 2.8 billion biochips as the initial contract. But the population of America is no more than 350 million. If it is an American project, why 2 point something billion biochips? It is a global project. It just wants to start with America. When they have seen that the thing is working and well taken, it will now be extended to the rest of the world. So that when you have the device to take anything, any information, any mark, it can now be used to control commerce. It can now be used if it can control all your health records. All your financial records can also go there. Your bank records can also go there, just like all your bank records are in your ATM. Am I right? The amount you have in the bank, the code to withdraw it, everything is there. So the thing can now be coded into the chip that is on your, in your head, forehead or in the right hand. And when you want to buy, you have to pay with money. And there is a global move to remove cash from the world. To get into a cashless society. So that whatever you want to pay for, you pay with your card. But the card is phasing out. And America is now phasing out the card and bringing in the identification uh, devices in the forehead or in the right hand. It was properly researched. What part of the body will be the ideal, the best part for this device? 
a number of companies went into the research. The outcome of it, two positions. In the forehead or in the right hand. Exactly the two positions the spirit of prophecy said some 2,000 years ago that that is the position where it will be taken. Somebody should be filled with understanding. So, the period we are living in now, when Trump won, to the consternation of everybody, confusion of everybody, including me, I got confused. Because every arrangement, every permutation gave it to Hillary. And as I was wondering, I heard the voice of God's spirit. And he said, this is the window. The window of revival of the last hour. <laughs> Listen. It doesn't call for clapping at all, at all. It means during the reign of a Trump, the gospel is going to prosper across the globe. Right now in the White House, they are having Bible study every Friday. Listen, please listen, listen. The Congress, the Senators and House of Representatives, every Monday, they have Bible study and prayer meeting. Every Wednesday, all the commissioners, all the ministers, minister for education, this and that, they call them secretary for this and that. They have Bible study every Wednesday. And on Friday, all the workers in White House have Bible study. And they have a chaplain, a no-nonsense man. I listened to one of his messages, and my hairs stood on end. If you hear the kind of message that Trump is hearing every week, you will understand why God fooled the people. Listen. Understanding the events of the last days. Trump woke up, was it two months ago, and he withdrew America's sponsorship of all the abortions that are done in the world. And all the gay laws that they are sponsoring that used to cost them billions of dollars every year in their budget. He canceled it. Said America can never sponsor abortion again. A number of things are changing. People are shouting. The Illuminatis are shouting. And you know that Illuminatis fill the world. There are tellers that are Illuminatis, I hope you know. Musicians are there. All walks of life. If you open Yahoo, you will see their advert. They are recruiting everybody to become a member now. Their advert, they are now open. Just like Obodi is open. Just like Rosicrucian is open. The Illuminatis are now open. They are recruiting members. You want to be rich, you want to be known, you want to have fame. You just join. And the simple thing you do, just sell your soul and go away with your song. The song of riches. The song of, uh, of, uh, of uh, splendor. But you have to sell your soul. You sell it to Satan. That was the bargain in, in Luke chapter 4. He told Jesus, you bow before me, I'll give you all these things. That's the same rule. That's how they are working. So today, we are given an opportunity. Finally, I read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in the mind of trouble, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is already present. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come 
Except here come the falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he as God seated in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember you not when I was with you that I told you these things. And now you know what restrained that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who now let it will continue to let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they might believe the lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but has pleasure in unrighteousness. Listen brethren. The word of God, the spirit of prophecy said. Because they had told the Thessalonian Christians that rapture had happened already. He said there's nothing like that. Say that event will not occur until there be the falling away first. The mass backsliding of Christians must take place. And that is what will necessitate the preaching of the gospel again to all the nations. Britain, that brought the church, brought Christianity to Nigeria, need the gospel now. Because the mass backsliding has taken them completely. In a particular part of Britain, about 500 churches have sold their, their church buildings. Because there are no more members coming to church. And out of the 500, 450 we are bought by Muslims and they are now mosques. There has to be the falling away first. The falling away first. In the places where they still gather together and they, they do church, they sing and they read the Bible. Where do you find the church of Jesus Christ for whom he died? Where do you find righteousness and true holiness? Go through all the places. You read the newspapers. You see them in, uh, in your WhatsApp posts. You see them in the online news. What is happening in the churches? How that immorality has taken over the world. How that pastors are lying with members of their congregation, taking them to bed. One of them gave a testimony in one newspaper, one magazine, and I read it. If a cover, cover page where the lady's picture was displayed and her testimony read that she was having, she was, uh, she was, she was sleeping with the pastor and that the pastor was so fantastic in bed that while they were sleeping that she burst out speaking in tongues. She was filled with the Holy Ghost. Why they were committing immorality. The pastor and the member of the flock. That she was filled with the Holy Ghost. Is there anything worse than that in apostasy? That was a testimony that a lady gave with her picture. In the cover of a news, a news magazine. I didn't say somebody said. I said I read it. I saw it in the newsstand in Abuja. And I read it. That's the kind of thing that we see. Apostasy. Where a pastor will, will be accused and it will be found to be true. 30 members of his congregation will be taking their turns in his house and will be lying with them. And he has, he has a wife. We are GOs. Their wives are accusing them of uh, of uh, serial adultery and that they won't continue again. They file for divorce and they divorce because the GOs are committing adultery with members of their fellowship, of their church. 
These are the days that the apostates, the falling away has occurred. And that is the reason the influence, the wave is right now, even the cold breeze is now in the watchman. That's the reason you can see every girl you see on the street is uh, going naked, half naked. Every girl you see, you see the hairdo. It is like mammoth spirit. It has to be long and drawn, just like the, 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 the mammoth pictures we used to see. That is the reason. Every dress now has to be body hog. The trousers have to be skin tight. Because the contours of the flesh has to be protruded, has to be shown clearly, so that they will evoke sensual feelings. They will seduce the people, and people will be committing immorality in their hearts. And after staying with somebody on the street and sharing, somebody will be drawn to the harlot in the hotel because he can no more control himself. That is the, the mystery of iniquity that is already at work. That is why things are the way they are. That is why we are having running battles with sisters, especially those in the campuses. Because of the period we are in the world, the backsliding, mass backsliding, as a result of the outworking of the mystery of iniquity. Spirit beings have entered into our physical world and have introduced the spirit of immorality. The Asmodi spirit, the marine spirits have entered into our world and have given people insatiable craving for sexual immorality. And the people that are thus possessed, the moment they meet with somebody, they transfer the spirit. Because any person that has sexual immorality with a possessed person automatically becomes possessed. And the girl we move from that possession has collected from the boy. Another boy we meet her and collect the spirit. And the boy we meet another girl and she will collect the spirit. And before you know it, the whole place is filled with insatiable lust for sexual immorality. And that's the reason people are no more contented with the old thing that they had. That faith that was once delivered to the saints. That's the reason they are rejecting it now. That's the reason a number of dresses are just tied. Gathering the, gathering the two legs together and showing the contours of the body. That's the reason that the people, there is nothing like praying again and asking God, who do I marry? The coordinator was talking last night about sampling. That's the reason for sampling. That's the reason people will begin to live in immorality in the name of dating. The language dating has come into watchman. Boyfriend, girlfriend has come into watchman. And that's the reason a campus boy will come and introduce a girl. This is my friend. Yes. And he will do it without any, any blush. He will introduce my friend to you. And the person he's introducing is a girl. Girlfriend. That's the reason if we open your phones now, the kind of text messages you have received from boys, they are mind-blowing. The kind you have responded, they, they can tear the boy apart. He may not sleep for the night. Yes. That's the reason the mystery of iniquity is already at work. The great falling away has already happened. And the wave of it, the wind, is already catching us cold. That's the problem we are having. That's the reason if we ask all of you now, sisters, to open your scarf, let's see what you are carrying on the head. We can see some green. We can see some indigo. We can see some, some big ones that are almost like the size of my hand. We can see all the nolly breads. We can see all the wools. We can see all those things that we would never touch before. Right now, the language is, what is wrong with it? What is wrong with it? That's the language. What is wrong with it? That is the reason. We are in rainy season. But if we come close to your lips now, 
they are all shining with oil. Yes. And if we accost you, you say, I have dry lips. My lips used to dry, even as humid as the air is. With all the water that fills the air, my lips will dry. You are only manufacturing reasons because you are caught up with the mystery of iniquity. That's the trouble. Because you have not understood the time that we are in. That's the reason. When you see others speaking in tongues and they are flowing, but you see them, they are almost naked. You want to be like them. That is the reason. There is nobody asking of the gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost anymore. Because before you talk about baptism of the Holy Ghost, you will talk about consecration and sanctification. Nobody talks about all those things again. We are talking about coming to church. Many of you were born in the church. But how many have their names in the book of life? We are in the end. The time of mass backsliding. The time of the walking of the mystery of iniquity. And that is the reason the nations of the world have gathered. And they say sex is no. You can go ahead from six years, eight years, go ahead. And they said, if they have a pregnancy they don't want, you give them unhindered access to contraceptives and abortion. The nations of the world make it free. If you are having any, any matter with uh, sex and you get pregnant, you go to the nearest government hospital and, uh, and secure abortion free of charge. In all the nations that have signed such laws. Yes, that is the way it is. And that is the reason you go to any hotel you like. You have condoms of diverse types, free of charge. Those things we are placed there with the money of taxpayers, the nations over. It is Plant Parenthood Federation that is supplying all the condoms free of charge to all the hotels. And Plant Parenthood Federation used to have billions of dollars from United States government every year. That is part of what the court, uh, Trump court said they won't sponsor it anymore. That is the reason. A sister told me how in their youth service orientation camp they held a seminar and they taught them how to play safe with government money. They hire consultants, pay them with government money, taxpayers' money. The money that I pay as tax, they go and hire consultants to come and teach you at the youth service how to play sex safe, how you will use this condom and that condom. And the one, he said that something incredible happened. And uh, suddenly the consultant called for volunteers so that they will come to the stage and demonstrate for others to see how to fit in the condoms. And some boys came out, some girls came out, and openly, before their faces, the sister said she couldn't bear it. She put down her face on the ground weeping, but the thing was done. She cannot tell me lies. She told me that crying, and people came, and before the glare of the crowd of coppers, they demonstrated how to fit in the condoms in their private parts. With government money. That's where we are in the world today. That is the reason our governors and our presidents, they will use the government money to hire prostitutes, even though they have wives. And that's the reason a lot of things are happening the way they're happening in the world. Because we are in the period prior to the manifestation of the man of sin, the period of mass backsliding. The period of the outworking of the mystery of iniquity. So you need to know that that pressure you are having is not ordinary. You need to know that we are at the brink of the end. You need to know that the last government has already completed its assignment. What is remaining is that that stone that was caught with the out hand landing on their feet. The 10 administrative districts has already been created since 1976. Remember the Bible said that those 10 kings, they don't have a crown yet, but they received authority the same hour the beast came into being. So they are there, they are known. 
They are waiting for the time for full manifestation. So this window that God has given by giving a Trump presidency in America is going to reverberate in all the world. The prophecy said he was going to rule for eight years. Within these eight years, we are going to run like fire, wildfire, with the gospel of the kingdom. We are going to tell it to our parents. We are going to tell it to our siblings. We are going to tell it to our friends. We are going to tell it to ourselves. We are going to make sure that we don't lose from this time. We are going to make sure that there is nothing on earth that will make us not to be rapturable. Because the time is fulfilled. The end is here with us. The United Nations, the beast from the earth. The United Religious Organization, the beast from the sea. But both of them united under the papacy. Under the last world empire. So what are you going to do? The reaction of the worry. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with those you are dresses? What are you going to do with all the things that you have acquired for your hairdo? For the things that you think is uh, for beauty? What are you going to do? Soon and very soon, we are going to appear before the judgment seat of the Lord. It shall not be long. We are going to appear and we give account what we have done in the flesh. Your campus pastor does not know what you are doing. Your campus sister leader may not know what you are doing, but you know what you are doing. And God sees you. He knows what you are doing. The time is up. What are you going to do? What is going to be your decision? The time is up. What are you going to do with the relationship you have been keeping? The things you have been saying, midnight calls you have been making, and working yourselves up. What are you going to do with them? All the relationship with boys. Don't you know there is time for everything? Don't you know there is time for everything? Very soon, when you get married, you can tell your husband, you can tell your wife all the romantic things you want to tell. But not now, brother. Not now, sister. No, not now. You don't need to pollute her heart. You don't need to make him commit immorality in the heart. Why do you send him to hell? Yet in the watchman. Why should we not be what God has called us to be? A light in the midst of darkness. The whole world is filled with darkness. But where is the light of the watchman? In the campus where you are, where is your light? Where is your light? That is what God is asking. What are you going to do? What is going to be your reaction? We gather together and at the end of the day, we just go out and continue the same. The way it is with the people we are sent to, that is how it is with us. But God will forbid it one million times. This night, I must take a decision. You must take a decision because the time is no more. Rise on your feet and let's pray. In a short while, he that shall come will come. He will not tarry. He will not tarry. He will not tarry. Very shortly, the trumpet will sound. He will not tarry. What are you going to do? Will you say, I didn't know? Will you say, I didn't know? But you have known now. What decision are you going to take? What are you going to decide? Concerning the boyfriend. Concerning the girlfriend. Concerning your life, call upon the Lord now while there is time. Call upon the Lord now. At any moment from now, the rapture will take place. The sound of the trumpet, that is what is going to be heard. What are you going to do with your life? The Lord is calling you. The Lord is saying, take it now. Receive it now. And open your heart to him.